undermining our food bowls. I think the topic sums it up. It's a big topic, it's a pertinent topic, and it's all of our business. This is everyone's business, not just big business. And we need to recognise this, and that's why we're here tonight. We've got farmers being forced, farmers here with us are being forced from their land to be speakers, activists, and environmental warriors. That's not what they, <laughs> that's not what they're on the land for. They're on the land because they love the land. Now they're fighting for it in a totally different forum. And they're fighting for us as well. And that's why we're having it here in the city, because us city folk need to realise that our country folk are fighting for us and for our food bowls. So Tim and Rosemary, who I'll introduce shortly, thank you for coming all the way down from as far away as the Liverpool Plains and Tamworth. But there's more to it. It's about our health. Our food is our medicine. If our food's our medicine, which is our health, we need to understand the ramifications of everything that's going on. And that's where our next speaker, Helen, will be talking to us from the point of view of doctors for the environment. In fact, I wish there was <laughs> no such thing. We, we should be looking after our environment, not raping it and then turning around and saying, oh, how can we remediate when it's all too late? So on that note, I'd like to invite uh, Sydney Food Fairness Alliance President Liz up to say a few words, acknowledge our sponsors, and then we're going to start with a, uh, a short video and, uh, and then our speakers will present. So uh, welcome everyone and uh, I'm looking forward to this evening. I'd like to start first of all by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land um, that we're meeting on and to pay respects to the owners, um, the owners of the land and to elders past and present. Um, of course, we all know they had a lot to teach us about proper husbandry of the land. We're particularly excited today to be um, uh, welcoming Rosemary and Tim and Helen to speak to us. This is an issue that we've been um, had on our back burner for a long time and we've been wanting to make closer contact with people from um, the Crew and Coal Action Group. We've had some email exchange, so it's great to have them here today to hear uh, firsthand about the work that they've been doing. Just for one person to thank finally, which is Costa, who's been a great supporter for us and um, we're delighted to see that he's got a new program on the ABC, so he'll be able to take his... Um, ideas and spread them further and wider and we look forward to uh, an ongoing relationship. Um, uh, the other thing I just wanted to say was that um, um, I don't know how many people know this is the Australian year of the farmer. Um, it seems a particularly important time when farmers seem to be more and more under threat to be looking at ways that we can all support farmers. So we really intend this to be the first event in this year where we're really going to look at what we can do to bring some of the issues for farmers and the pressures that they're under um, into the public arena and see what action we can take to support farmers. So thank you very much and look forward to a great evening. Tim Duddy's the spokesperson of the Karuna Coal Action Group on the Liverpool Plains. He's a seventh generation farmer. He knows the land, as most of the farmers you would have noticed in that film, se seventh generation, third generation. These are people that grow out of the soil and they stay there because it's their passion. Tim's been a local councillor involved with water and environment committees. He's been on the New South Wales Farmers and the National Farmers Federation. He a, was a, an original member of the NAMO Namoy Water Study Committee, and he's a vocal advocate for the management of our water resources. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim. Good evening. Where I come from, the Liverpool Plains, some 12,000 square kilometres situated in the northwest of New South Wales, where we produce 37% of the nation's cereals in our own right. When we're discussing food security, with the diets that we enjoy from day to day, we can grow enough food to sustain ourselves in the backyard or on a terrace or in the nature strip. But if we are going to eat breads and cereals and pastas, we actually need considerable broad scale, broad acre productive land. And there is nowhere in this country 
that stands the test better than where I come from. Underlaying our alluvial floodplains is a sustainable yield of some 316,000 megalitres of water, which is about half the quantity of Sydney Harbour that goes into food and fibre production annually in the Namoi Valley. As there was a welcome to country given earlier in the evening, I think we should take great solace in being able to learn from a civilisation that can live on a land for 40,000 years and not destroy it. With the way that we are travelling as Anglo-Saxon um, arrivees to this country, when we have been here some 200, imagine what it would look like in 40,000 years of our inhabitation at the rate we are going. In 1935, my grandfather started farming on the Liverpool Plains as cultivating black soil to grow wheat. People came from miles around and told him he was absolutely mad because he was destroying good sheep country. They spent six weeks around the clock farming a 35 acre paddock which is only the size of about uh, 85 football fields. And from that grew one of the most productive and innovative farming areas in the nation. Our practices in farming will stand up to any practice in the world as conservation farming goes. The people of the Liverpool Plains are very proud of what they've done and they've farmed for a very long time and we're very happy to remain farmers. In November 2005, my mother, who is the trustee of a local hall, had a phone call from the New South Wales Department of Minerals and Energy suggesting they wanted to hold a public meeting. It was at that time that we were told that we were about to be um, looked at for explored for coal um, mining um, viability. About four months later, they gave a licence to BHP Billiton for a record price of $132 million. The, up until that date, the highest figure that had been paid for exploration licences in the state was about $4 million. So it was an extraordinary thing to suddenly have this huge figure. Um, the now disgraced minister in McDonald stood up and crowed from Parliament what a wonderful thing it was for the future development of this state that we would be opening a new coal field. Not one person from that government went up to that area or took a map to the Department of Agriculture and said, what are we giving away here? We were the pioneers in water reform and any person from the Department of Water would have said, these areas have huge underlying water resources, but no one did that. They simply drew a square on a map without a site visit and sold it to an international company. As a generally law-abiding community, we decided that we would engage in the process and we were confident that good would prevail and the land would not be destroyed. We engage with the miners, we engage with the government. We spent hundreds of thousands of dollars of the community's money. We went to court several times 
actually some 23 times, we went all the way to the Supreme Court and we won. Five weeks later, the miners had the law changed. What we are dealing with here is agriculture under siege. Not for one moment do I suggest that we should not have a mining industry. But we need to have the right mine in the right place, not the wrong mine in the wrong place. And the scale of these projects that are being proposed are the scale of which no one has ever seen before. And it's not because we need that for Australian industry, it's because we're sending it all on a ship for someone else to build their country while they mine ours. After the um, BHP proposal, we then had the Chinese-owned Shenhua that was given another expiration licence adjoining that one, and they paid some $357 million, yet another record. And then we ended up with Eastern Star Gas and Santos. So we go from a greenfield site to having two world-scale mining projects proposed for both open cut and underground coal and over the top of this is laying the gas. And still, no one is saying there is a problem here with the water issues. My family, with the assistance of the entire community, blockaded BHP in the end and prevented them from gaining access to, public, to the private land of the region. What then happened, the New South Wales government gave us the water study that we had asked for to scientifically understand the region. And meanwhile, every part of the mining industry is working in the background trying to prevent that from being an effective thing to address the issues of the region. What we deal with here is corruption of a scale that no one has ever seen and no one can fathom or understand. As luck would have it, our local member is Tony Windsor, who ended up with the balance of power, as you would all be aware, and now we have a federal committee with some $150 million put aside to do some of this strategic land planning. But these are things that should have been done 30 years ago. They are not things that should be done piecemeal now that we have these projects over the top with these huge amounts of money and these huge machines behind them. The thoughts that I'll leave you with tonight is if you take the money out of these arguments, there is actually not another valid thing that these projects stand up on. They don't stand up on the environment, they don't stand up on the jobs, they don't stand up on the regional development, they don't stand up on input to local government. The whole lot of it is spin. And we've spent six years looking at other regions and how they are impacted. The mining industry would have us believe that it is a short-term sequential land use. When you look at the reports that have been written with these projects, they say the impact of the water is something like three to 5,000 years. That's not short-term, as far as I can see. If anyone in this room wants to help, they need to get everyone to understand what we're talking about. They need to get governments to understand, they need to mobilise, and the day the farmers take to Macquarie Street, and I'm sure they will, we need to fill the streets from the suburbs and do it. Because the only way governments understand is when everybody is affected. 
The one thought I will leave you with tonight is, you cannot eat money, and if we destroy our most productive agricultural lands, Australia will have no future to be able to feed itself safely. If I live in China, I can still spray DDT on my lettuce. And if you want to eat pro products that are sprayed without the controls that we enjoy in Australia, that's the way to ensure it happens. Thank you very much. That's, that's coming from the place where it's going on. And thank you, Tim, for bringing, bringing your passion and your pain to share with us because that's what it is. It's, it's, it's not kind of like about a, a nice passionate delivery. This is our pain because it's our business, as I said before. It really is our business and uh, I appreciate you being here. Our next speaker, Rosemary Nankeevil, is the CSG committee chairperson of the Karuna Coal Action Group. Did you guys share the drive down? No. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thought it would have been nice to have been in the back and listened to you, babe. <laughs> uh, um, cut to the chase. Rosemary's a farmer. She's a grazier on the Liverpool Plains, She's running a cereal and cattle producing property, again, which, be, which has been in the family for generations. We're talking history. We're talking connection to land. And this is where we get an association with these people. She's got two sons, so she's a mum. She's just one of us, but she's also an advocate. And how did, how did Rosemary get involved with this? All of a sudden, Santos exploration started taking place around her property. Seismic testing, all these things started to appear, as, as Tim said, one day, things start happening. She didn't have a choice. She had to take action and she's here to, uh, to share her experiences and her, her fight that she's living every day. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Rosemary. Well, uh, good evening and, is that working? Yeah. Good evening and thank you for inviting me to attend. It's a great privilege to be asked and, um, I'm here basically to tell you about our journey against coal seam gas on the Liverpool Plains. <clears throat> um, I won't go into how good the Liverpool Plains is, because it's pretty obvious. Um, but one of the issues is, is it, its proximity to ports, and that's a, you know that uh, it can be a real geographical thing. This um, extraction of gas and and coal. Um, the, the Liverpool Plains is now completely covered by exploration licences, uh, as is most of New South Wales, and I think we've got some maps for... Um, this is the current mineral titles over New South Wales. Then the next one, that's the mineral title applications. Keep going, Tim. It gets better. Current coal titles. Keep going. Coal title applications. Current petroleum titles. Petroleum title applications. Is that the last one? Yeah, that's the last yeah. one. So, look, there's not much there for anyone to live, let alone farm or whatever. In October 2008, Santos called a public meeting at our local hall, which is Blackful, tiny little village, magnificent little hall, typical of all those towns. Um, and it was to introduce coal seam gas and their concept of exploring seismic activity, all that sort of stuff. So the locals turned up, there were probably over 90 of us, we were pretty angry, we'd been brought up on the whole coal drama and we all strongly believed in the protection of this land. Um, gas was a completely new thing, um, we were incredibly fortunate from my point of view to have um, George Laskell of uh, the Hunter Valley Protection Group where they've been, which is magnificent as you know, wine, gr wine growing region at Broke. Uh, George has been researching it for years, I talked to him, I did a tiny bit of research and then fell upon the late Mark Atkinson's report on the Pilliga State Forest. <coughs> um, this report covered the spills that occurred in 2001, 
um, at the time when Eastern Star Gas was, um, well, Eastern Star Gas, as you know, was chaired by Minister John Anderson, who was Deputy Prime Minister. Um, hang on, I've got this speech, it's gone, it's quite odd, I've cut and pasted it somewhere. <coughs> it was, uh, so we had this, what I'm saying is that we had the expertise of the Broke area and then what was happening in the Pilliga Forest. It was, it was pretty disgusting. It's just a whole litany of spills, methane, migra methane migration, destruction of lag large tracts of land. So at this meeting, initially I asked um, Santos about it and they looked at us and said, oh, I've never heard of this. Well, Santos at that time had a 20% shareholding and 35% share of the tenements. So we were under no illusion that Santos was going to be terrifically transparent. <coughs> other figures, that other people asked questions about the Java mudslides, where over 30,000, the figures vary. I've heard up to 100,000 people have been displaced, infrastructure destroyed. Santos walked away owing $22 million. Um, the mudslides in Java continue, they've become a tourist attraction and most people are still uncompensated for the loss of their homes and their land. So to us, Santos came with a severe credibility problem and they clearly um, were a bit short on the lack of corporate responsibility. <clears throat> Since then, Santos has completed its seismic testing. They have drilled numerous coal, hole, coal holes, managing effectively to find the weak, the gullible, and the financially strapped who have allowed them on their lands for coal hole drilling. They have set up an office in Gunnedah, set out, send out a, a glossy quarterly update, spend a lot of money telling us what fine corporate citizens they are, and still have managed to evade important questions such as, will you frack? What will you do with the wastewater? What you, will you do with the many tonnes of waste salt that will be extracted with this waste water? As probably most of you are aware, exploration licences for coal seam gas maps have been, for coal seam gas, have been issued across the state. <coughs> the process of, of coal seam extraction requires drilling into the coal seam gas aquifer, the depths of which vary, and extracting water to release the pressure. The gas then flows to the top where it is separated from the water. The water is extracted in, in most cases around 0.6 megalitres per day and is then put into holding or evaporation ponds. This water has a high salt content. Eastern Star gas figures talk of 13,500 milligrams per litre of salt. For a megalitre, which is the size of um, an Olympic pool, can produce 13,500 tonnes of salt. Given that Santos has said, and I believe this to be a very conservative figure, that they will extract five gigalitres of water from a coal seam gas development on the Liverpool Plains, this would mean that 13,500 tonnes of toxic salt per development will have to be disposed of. Santos has no solution of what to do with this toxic salt. The extraction of large amounts of water, salt and gas will effectively depressurise the aquifer. It is doubtful that aquifers will recover from this sort of a extraction. On Monday night, Professor Pills gave, um, was on the 7.30 report for the drying up of the Turl Mill Lakes. Now, it, during that report, he said that coal seam gas extraction was akin to long wall mining. So we're looking at massive extraction, massive salt, as you can understand that salt and water has been holding the land as it is for generations, uh, for, you know, ever since the world was invented. Um, <clears throat> as Senator Heffernan repeatedly asked the gas companies, how do you fix an aquifer? Can an aquifer be repaired? The gas companies have never been able to answer. They have no answer. The aquifers which underlay the Liverpool Plains are at the moment well managed. Irrigation licences in this area have been cut by as much as 70% and aquifers are recharging. However, large scale extraction by the coal seam gas companies will also draw down on the potable aquifers above, which will impact upon our, upon our surface waters. One of the great myths the coal seam gas companies say is, oh no, there's an impermeable barrier. They don't, you know, and they operate underneath the impermeable barrel, a, bar a barrier. They don't account for the natural cracking, the fissures, the folding and the thrust of the earth. <coughs> um, <coughs> where am I up to? It is said that farmers only fight over wives and water. And I can tell you, Sandos now has one huge fight on their hands. As a nation, we are heavily dependent on our groundwater. Little is known of the interconnectivity of the aquifers. Our Great Artesian Basin and Murray-Darling Basins are really our only source of significant water, and our dependence on these ancient water systems is frightening. Destruction of these 
will have extraordinary repercussions on just us as a, as a state, as a people, but will change our farming practices forever. For example, the Powder River Valley in Wyoming, formerly a productive cattle producing area and um, you know, associated hay production, etc., now is the kind of area where hobby farmers such as Sandra Bullock run a few horses. The underground water is not there. Uh, and the Powder River Valley has been going for about 30 to 40 years. So we're looking at a really long-term thing. We cannot, you know, no one can hope to really assess what's going to happen in 40 years' time. Above the ground, we face an extraordinary amount of infrastructure. There will be pipelines, compressor stations, holding ponds and well heads. Well heads can be spaced 150 to 500 metres apart. There is a process known as a fill-in, where wells can be spaced closer as the gas production slows. Of course, you have heard, all heard of the term fracking, involving the injection of many millions of litres of water, sand and chemicals into the coal seam, coal seam to release the gas. This process effectively shatters the aquifer. The force which the frack chemicals and water is pumped into the ground is believed to have caused earth tremors, tremors and triggered, triggered earthquakes up to 5.3 on the Richter scale in several areas in America. As the Liverpool Plains is adjacent to the Hunter Mukai fault line, we have good reason to be nervous. There are many documented cases of water contamination in the United States related to fracking. And just recently, the EPA in America has recognised this connection. This is after you know, 30 to 40 years. The reality is, however, that <clears throat> we have also been criticised by many people for drawing comparisons to the United States. So the reality of this is, however, that the USA has the luxury of many snow-fed rivers and the water they extract is around 850 grams per litre. So the situation is far more in seri serious in Australia with, as I said before, 13,500 milligrams per litre. The Liverpool Plains fertility is due to the amazing black self-munching soils of the plains. These soils are constantly moving and turning over. They have a unique water holding capacity, which makes it extremely difficult to work on the plains after even very small rainfall. Many farmers get very excited and think that's their day to go to town if we've got five mils of rain, because uh, you just can't do anything. <clears throat> farmers are constantly replacing poly pipelines and fences. In the early days of settlement, roads on the Liverpool Plains were built around the foothills for good reasons. If a bullock dray became bogged, it would be there for many days. Disturbance of topsoil has led to waterways and surface water creating major channels and erosion. Farmers through many generations of experience now practice techniques to avoid disturbance of the soils on the plains, techniques which have taken years to evolve. The construction of many wells and all-weather ro roads will create huge erosion. It is no wonder that the farmers are justifiably angry at the thought of this short-term industry coming into areas such as the Liverpool Plains. Now, this is an example of you know, our fantastic soil. This actually happened in grassland. There's an existing natural gas pipeline about half the size of what the coal seam gas people um, <coughs> uh, uh, want to put. You know, these are the sort of pipelines that will be crossing it. Now, this happened on a grassed-in area on the side of the road. Um, it started from a very small uh, piece of erosion, 3,000 tonnes of rocks later, um, uh, $800,000, just keep going, Tim, um, they managed to um, pick it, uh, fix it, and the last person to saw, saw it, who was a soil expert, said, well, that's not going to last long. So we're going to, just these wells, at pipelines crisscrossing is going to create its own incredible um, hassles in itself. One of the arguments constantly made by gas companies is that agriculture and gas can coexist. From this photo, you can see that it would be very difficult, if not impossible, for this type of coexistence. And, you know, there's a, very few studies have been done on the impacts upon grazing cattle within, you know, close to gas wells. And a lot of evidence from the states is emerging that suggests that cows lose 30% of their fertility, that contamination issues can occur. Um, there's been and getting to the food chain, there's been a sort of a, a whole litany of things starting to come out of America now, which I'm sure Helen's going to cover a lot better than me. The other argument, of course, is employment. The gas industry does employ a lot, but this is in the majorly in the construction stage, um, because the next thing that they say is, well, look, we won't be interrupting your gas company, so we won't be interrupting your practices, we won't be doing, we will never get in your way, because, you know, we can run this from Brisbane on a computer. So... <coughs> The state government is excited about the royalties. However, in New South Wales, 
which is the only state in Australia to do this, the gas industry has a five-year royalty holiday, that which increases from 1% per year. So after five years, they pay 6%, 7%, 8%, 9%, 10%. Unfortunately, <coughs> the life of a gas well is very short. Um, it is believed that the most gas comes out of a gas well in the first 18 months. So, you know, and often wells probably don't last that long. I and mean, there are plenty of wells that put down that only last a very short period of time. There is, of course, the occasional nirvana that goes on for 25 years and they all think it's wonderful. But the point I'm making is there is not a lot of money coming out of this for the state. Um, there's also other incentives for the gas industry, such as a 50% production um, cost tax, so that's um, deducted, 50% of their costs. And, um, you know, it's just incredible that the New South Wales state government is so excited about it. <clears throat> Probably one of the bi biggest issues in this, that this industry is nearly entirely self-regulated. Well, it is entirely self-regulated. With only four mine inspectors in New South Wales at the time, at the moment, it is clear that the government will be relying on a lot of self-monitoring. It is ironical to think that in the 1950s, a government employee had to be present when any drilling in the Great Artesian took place for water. Such was their concern for the preservation of groundwater. Now gas companies in Queensland are drilling as fast as they can, figures suggesting that 40,000 gas wells will be drilled in Queensland alone. Spills and mishaps supposedly have to be reported by the company itself. Recently in the Pilliga, which is Australia's largest intact temperate natural woodlands, Narrabri had a large spill in July last year. At this time, Eastern Star Gas was in negotiations with Santos um, and as is subsequently happened, Sandhorse has, bought, has taken Eastern Star Gas over. <clears throat> this was a spill that was not reported. Santos, having, over, having taken over Eastern Star Gas, still didn't report it. It wasn't until a vigilant um, local spotted it and took it to the media. That same guy has been reporting spills, etc., for um, many times, and it's only since the Greens and the media have become interested that any notice has been taken of him. This spill was, they say, 10,000 litres of sump pond. Trees and vegetation is dying. The area is covered in a black tar-like substance, very similar to the spill reported in 2002 by Atkinson. It was not under... Oh, yeah. Our recent... I've been asked to speak about the blockade, and blockades are a funny thing. Our recent blockade at Spring Ridge was in response to Santos's attempt to put up pilot production in this area. Pilot production is actually seen as being in the expiration, in the expiration phase. <clears throat> it means um, it's construction of five or to seven wells, um, three to five, seven wells, depending on what they want to do. They have some ponds, they extract water. It's a way of measuring the gas. So for this to come under expiration phase, I mean, if you're thinking there's just a few people out making a couple of odd drill holes, it's nothing like this. And there has never been, in the history of New South Wales, of any gas extraction, that pilot production has not turned into full-scale production. So <clears throat> we sort of... <sighs> the government had taken no notice of us. Santos, who were bound by the water study, the Catchment catchment water study, really were taking no notice of us. And so we called a blockade. And blockades are great in some ways. We had a fantastic... Um, response. Everybody turned up. We had over 300 visitors. It was a fantastic 21 days. But there's actually nothing worse than sitting on the side of the road with 80-year-old farmers who have worked all their lives, done, oh, shit, sorry, um, sitting in the sun like it was a, a heat wave. And these people are sitting there protecting their patch and the government has done nothing. No one is looking out for us. Anyway, <clears throat> and their wives, don't forget the wives, fabulous, with the cakes and the morale and everything else. Um, <laughs> it is also, um, another thing that was terribly significant, I thought, and showed our commitment to the cause, was that on the second day, we heard the police were coming in. The drill rigs were coming in, and um, they were coming in under police escort. <clears throat> and so we were on the phones like, the night before saying, well, come on, everybody, this is it. More, more people turned up. We probably had over 100 people on the second day. And that, so it shows that we are prepared to put our, life, put our reputations on the line and get arrested protecting our stuff. <clears throat> right, it also illustrates very much that Sandals simply does not have a social licence to operate in our area. Further down the track, we are coming, becoming aware of the rehabilitation issues faced with this type of extraction. <clears throat> 
As I previously mentioned, there are 40,000 wells in Queensland. We have no idea what's happening in New South Wales. <clears throat> when production finishes, wells are simply lopped off below ground level and the holes are cemented. Cement deteriorates and steel casings rust. The integrity of this well can never be guaranteed as the earth is constantly moving. We will leave to our children and our grandchildren a long-lasting liability as these wells will have to be constantly maintained. In the USA, it costs around 800000 to cap and fill these bores. This is a huge impost that we are putting on future generations for these multinational companies that are invading our country. So in conclusion, is this industry really worth the loss of prime food growing regions? As our governments, are our governments really strong enough and long-sighted enough to stand up to the gas industry? It appears not. There are lobbyists throughout the whole, from the industry that have graduated from New South Wales Parliament and Federal Parliament and are working actively with the energy companies. And to me, that's incredibly corrupt in its own way. <coughs> The f number of former government staffers, ministers and advisers being lured into the gas industry for huge salaries is to be unreal. Our universities are funded heavily by the mining and gas companies. Surely the easiest way to turn our best and br brightest to lose, turn out our best and brightest to lose independent thought. We have a huge task ahead of us to guarantee that our children and grandchildren enjoy the same access as we have had to fresh food and uncontaminated water. It is only through the strength of the people that we can bring about change and I ask you all to help us out on this and demand that our valuable food regions, food growing regions, areas of extreme conservation value such as the Pilliga, which I would like to say many, uh, many of our forefathers believe that's where our rainfall comes from. So it's not just a conservation issue, but it is also for the bioregional bio diversity. <clears throat> um, I think in closing of uh, talking about our commitment to the land, there's one thing that my father always said to us, and I'm pretty sure Tim's father said it, but it, all our lives it was drummed into us to look after the land, for the land will look after you. So I ask you, what are we doing? Thank you, Rosemary. <laughs> Our next speaker... Yeah. Actually, the, the, the thing that's uh, ringing in my ears from that little video that we listened to and it it's uh, resonating from Rosemary. There's one, one thing that made my right ear um, stick up and it says, these wells will be cased to hopefully stop leakage. <laughs> and uh, yeah, that, that's kind of still drumming around in between my ears. Our next speaker is Dr. Helen Redmond from Doctors for the Environment. Helen is a rehabilitation physician who works in private and public practice in Sydney. Since 2006, she's been uh, a member of Doctors for the Environment whose aim is to educate the public, educate policy makers and the professional uh, uh, and the medical profession about the relationships between our health and our environment. She has also presented evidence to both the Federal Senate Inquiry and the New South Wales Parliamentary Inquiry into Coal Seam Gas. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Helen. Um, thanks very much for inviting me. Um, I guess we've heard quite a lot about food security and also food quality from our previous two speakers. And in fact, they're both essential determinants of population health. Uh, but there are some other very important ways that coal seam gas um, puts health at risk. And I think um, in, the, in the sort of debate over this, over this industry, this is often a consequence that is somewhat forgotten. So I'd like to focus today on talking about chemicals, the coal seam contaminants, air pollution and also mental health. But first, I'd just like to dispel a myth. Um, coal seam gas and shale are actually both types of unconventional gas. A lot is made of the differences between shale gas in the United States and coal seam gas in Australia by the industry here. They claim that no comparisons can be made and therefore the increasingly concerning reports coming out of the United States have absolutely no relevance to us. But in fact, there's a lot of coal seam gas in the United States um, and there's plentiful shale gas in Australia. In fact, in the Cooper Basin, there's a lot of shale gas in South Australia. BHP are looking to develop that um, 
quite soon. So the extraction te techniques are exactly the same, and it's only the depth and the permeability of the rock formation that is different. Coal seam gas tends to be shallower and more permeable, and hence not all wells require hydraulic fracturing. That said, in the Camden Gas Project, AGL has said that they fracked 60% of those wells. So it's quite a high percentage. So the unconventional gas industry uses chemical additives for both drilling wells and for hydraulic fracturing or fracking. 20 to 80% of the fracking fluid stays underground. And fracking can create connections between the coal seam and aquifers. And even just depressurising the coal seam um, can change water levels in surrounding groundwater systems and also the, the slow flow of water under, underground. Our single biggest barrier to understanding the direct health impacts of this industry is that there is no mandatory requirement for companies to disclose exactly what chemicals they use. And that's the case in the United States and also here in Australia. Big problem. So what information has been published recently about the toxicity of these chemicals? Well, a UK study reviewed information on 260 chemicals which were supplied to New York State for the industry, and these are the findings here. In Australia, NICNAS is responsible for undertaking comprehensive hazard assessments on chemicals used in industry. In their evidence to the Federal Senate inquiry, they reported that they had a, a list of about 50 or 60 chemicals, but that wasn't definitive, and they were still gathering, it's just all that they'd gathered so far. And this is our national chemical regulator, so they're supposed to know what's going on but they clearly didn't. In fact, they'd only examined four of those chemicals and none had been examined specifically uh, for use in fracking. And this is an important point. So while there must, might be one set of safety concerns if you spill something on your skin, there might be a whole different sort of health impact if you're, say, ingesting that chemical in small quantities in your drinking supply over a long period of time. These are the four assessed chemicals. The persulfates, which are the first two, are also used in hair bleach. And butoxyethanol is actually a carcinogen. And that's now, that now contaminates the drinking water. It's an underground water supply for a town called Pavilion in Wyoming in the United States. And that's thanks to intensive gas operations in that area. That's a whole town with contaminated water. Um, other chemicals that we know are used in Australia are there, um, and they include ethylene glycol, that's also used to make antifreeze. Um, if you ingest ethylene glycol, it starts to break down in the body, creates crystals which deposit in your kidneys and affect your kidney function. And coal seam gas companies frequently infer safety of these chemicals due to the fact that some are components of household products. However, just because we might have hair bleach and antifreeze in our cupboard doesn't mean that it's safe to drink it. It's amazing the stuff they expect us to buy, isn't it? Really? <laughs> um, so this, I'm going to talk about this paper a fair bit, Spamberg and Oswald. It's very recently um, published. Um, just last month, in fact, and it's about the US unconventional gas experience. And it gives us an indication of the direct health consequences that we're going to face here in Australia unless we fully assess and regulate these chemicals. This study is a collection of case reports of ill health in animals and their human owners living in close proximity to gas operations. In one case, the release of fracking fluids into a cow pasture killed 17 cows in one hour. Now, that stuff's got to be highly toxic to do that. Exposure to gr drilling chemicals occurred um, in another case when blowout fluids ran into a pasture and pond where bred cows were grazing. And their calves were subsequently stillborn and they had a lot of congenital, congenital defects. So there were two cases where um, there was a sort of an inadvertent case control study on cattle farms where they had um, cattle in one paddock that was exposed to gas wastewater, um, which had been released um, probably illegally into the stream. Um, and then another group of cattle, another group of, <laughs> another group of cattle that were away from the contaminated water. And in both those cases, in both those cases, about half the, the cattle exposed died, and for the rest, there was a lot of stillbirths, a lot of um, deformities, um, or stunted growth in the offspring. 
whilst the cattle that were away um, from that contaminated water were completely healthy, unaffected. Okay, so of the 24 cases they examined, um, 16 documented health problems. Um, and of course, having these sorts of symptoms doesn't prove that the gas operations cause them, and we all get headaches, right? However, um, they've described two cases in a lot of detail, and the evidence for causality, I think, is quite overwhelming. In the first, a child was living in a house less than a mile from a well pad and became unwell with fatigue, severe abdominal pain, sore throat and backache. Eventually the child was hospitalised about six months later and they had delirium or acute confusional state and tests revealed arsenic poisoning. The family stopped drinking the water from their well, despite later testing, much later, about a year later, which indicated it was safe to drink. And the child gradually recovered, but they did lose a year of school. Now, there'd been, if they hadn't been for the fact that there'd been numerous animal deaths, both companion animals and, and, um, uh, and herd animals, then the doctors in the hospital probably wouldn't have ordered the right tests and the diagnosis wouldn't have been made. Um, the family of, of, of this particular household and another one mile away were then, I think, randomly monitored for um, these sorts of things. And that urine tests revealed high levels of phenol, which is a metabolite of benzene. Um, the levels were consistent with chronic exposure of 0.5 to 4 parts per billion um, in the air of benzene. So they were experiencing symptoms such as headaches, extreme fatigue, nosebleeds, rashes, loss of smell, loss of hearing and they were advised to move out by their physicians. One of the families did move out and they got better. The other family stayed and they didn't get better. In fact, they got a bit worse. These last two cases illustrate the other source of toxins in unconventional gas operations, and that is the contaminants which coexist with gas in the shale or coal formation. Coal seam water contains volatile organic compounds, including the BTEX chemicals. It also contains heavy metals and radioactive compounds. It's a toxic brew, basically. Oh, and salt, lots of salt. And when, that, when those piles of salt emerge from all these operations, I think, as, I think it might have been Rosemary who mentioned that it, would, it, was, it was not, it's, it's basically contaminated with trace heavy metals and radioactive isotopes from the, from the coal seam water. So it's not just salt you can put on your, put on your tomato sandwich or something. Okay. Um, so, okay. So toluene and ethyl benzene um, can damage the nervous system, liver and kidneys, and ethyl benzene is a possible human carcinogen. Benzene is a known carcinogen. Long-term exposure to benzene can affect your bone marrow, cause anemia and eventually leukemia. Benzene can present a risk to health even in minute quantities. So the safe level in drinking water is actually um, the level of detection, which is one part per billion. BTEX chemicals have been banned for use in fracking in Queensland and New South Wales, but the fracking process itself may release BTEX from sediments and into surrounding air and water. And volatile, volatile coal seam contaminants like this and also volatile chemicals that are used in, in drilling and fracking cause air pollution in the vicinity of gas operations. And that either occurs from the wastewater that's lying in evaporation um, ponds or due to a flaring of excess gas. And um, one practice that was described in this article was that they use the wastewater and they spread it on the icy roads to break up the ice. So it's just kind of lying around in puddles just um, on the roads. This is how the dogs and cats um, uh, were, became deceased from drinking this water anyway. Um, so inhalation is yet another route of exposure. And it was probably to blame for a lot of the benzene poisoning um, in the case that we've just described. And in the case of arsenic poisoning of the child um, near where they lived, the wastewater was held in ponds and it was deliberately misted into the air in order for it to evaporate more quickly. Um, and it's probably um, turned the ar um, arsenic into arsine, which is a highly, vo a highly sort of um, active gas and very poisonous. Um, in addition to these sort of direct health effects, there's a lot of indirect health consequences via greenhouse emiss emissions from the extraction and combustion of gas. Fugitive emissions of methane, which is a potent greenhouse gas, contribute substantially to its greenhouse footprint. 
And the jury is most definitely out on whether there is in fact a greenhouse advantage of gas over coal once emissions from the full life cycle um, of gas are taken into account. So as a transitional fuel, it's, you know, it's got a credibility problem. Um, and the International Energy Agency has warned that there's a danger that over-reliance on gas will delay the vital transition to renewable energy that's needed to prevent dangerous climate change, which is in itself the biggest health threat to ever face humankind. And it's already killing people. So, all right, so that's a picture of flaring. Finally, I'd just like to mention mental health and the mental health consequences for families and communities who are facing the sort of battle that these wonderful people are facing. Coal seam gas mining threatens existing sustainable industries such as Hunter Valley wine and tourism, Liverpool Plains food production and beef, uh, Queensland beef exports to name but a few. It also threatens natural bushland reserves such as the Pilliga scrub and it industrialises the landscape. It can divide communities into those for and against and create economic winners and losers. And as communities lose their livelihoods and their landscape is affected, their mental health suffers. And this has been very well documented in US gas communities, but also in New South Wales um, by Dr. Steve Robinson in Gloucester and Dr. Wayne Somerville up in the Northern Rivers. And both these doctors presented evidence to the New South Wales in inquiry. So we obviously need more regulation. The oil and gas industry body, APIA, assures us, and I quote from their website, some of the chemicals used in fracking may have some toxic characteristics. However, when diluted, such as in fracking gels, they present minimal to no harm, uh, to no human or ecological risks. Now, I don't know how they can conclude that when there have been no comprehensive studies of animals or human populations exposed to fracking activities. This is a dangerous lack of knowledge for an industry that has already been granted tens of billions of dollars worth of projects in, um, in, a, in Australia. So Doctors for the Environment recommends a moratorium, and this is what we've asked for, until a compre comprehensive health impact assessment be taken nationally, nationally and of the entire unconventional gas industry, and that includes any shale gas developments that might occur in the future, and as a matter of urgency. Until there's a strong legislative framework which includes the mandatory disclosure of what chemicals and products are used, how much and what stays underground, as well as routine monitoring of air, water and soil for contamination, we're basically working in the dark as to what the likely health impacts are going to be short and long term. I'll leave you with a quote from Bamberger that puts it in a nutshell. Without rigorous scientific studies, the gas drilling boom sweeping the world will remain an uncontrolled health experiment on an enormous scale. And also, this is a quote from a woman who's done an enormous amount of work in this area. At what point does preliminary evidence of harm become definitive evidence of harm? When someone says, we were not aware of the dangers of these chemicals back then, whom do they mean by we? A cute cut. Uh, this was my favourite. I, I looked at a few, but I like this one a bit. Because I thought, my God, if I'm a farmer and I've got CSG coming up one road and a, a wind turbine coming up the next, the other, I know which one I'm going to choose. <laughs> That's all. Thank you. Thank you, Helen. I always like a cartoon. I might get depressed. There's, there's an opening question. <laughs> yes, well, um, being the uh, oracle of all knowledge, <laughs> that's, that's, that's one I actually can't answer. There has been considerable discussion about that, about changing the access of the earth and things by sending things from one side to another. Um, all I can say is, Mother Nature always gets even in the end. And if we don't slow down a little, there will be no turning back. Um, with regard to the rail lines, the reason why coal has come to our area is because we have a rail line. The reason why we have a rail line is because it was built to take 
grain and wool and cattle because they were productive agricultural areas. The areas that don't have rail lines weren't productive agricultural areas. They may still have coal under them, but they are, it is not viable, supposedly, for this industry that has so much money it doesn't know what to do with it to build a new rail line purpose-built for its carriage. So I don't quite understand how it works. Um, there is considerable confrontation going on between the um, wheat board or the grains board and the Mac village, which is the village that is designed to house the construction workers for the mine, which was supposed to be built at Weres Creek, which is one of our larger um, grain terminals. And the Mac Village people decided that they were going to build on a sports field some 300 metres from the grain terminal, then wrote to the grain terminal and said, well, you're not going to be able to take delivery 24 hours because we have workers living here. So um, the grains board took Mac Villages to court and that's yet to play out. So that's going to be a very interesting thing when they come into your area and then start saying we can't use it for what it was actually designed to do in this town. This is true. Do, Pete, do you need the microphone for the recording? Yeah. Okay. So, uh, next, anyone? Um, there's been a fair bit of talk, and I don't know whether it's coming from the Liverpool Plains or whether it's just in the Hunter, of New South Wales adopting a royalty for the regions program like they have in Western Australia. Um, I had grave concerns about this. If one, if you follow the, the logic of reasoning that the, the, that the mining companies are digging all this gas up on our behalf, the royalty should actually go to the whole of Australia. But if the royalties are actually needed to go back to the regions to fix up the mess that the coal companies and the gas companies have made, shouldn't that be part of their cost of business? And shouldn't we be going, no, the royalties shouldn't be going back to the region because they should just be paying for that anyway? Can I have a to Tim. Yeah, um, I think you've, you've touched on an issue that's to do with the externality, what we call the externalities of mining a, anything in particular. So um, the, the cost, the external costs are the effects on social, social effects, health effects, uh, the cost of rehabilitation uh, and those sorts of flow-on things that, that are not direct costs to the um, industry, to the mining company, but they are flow-on effects. And if you include, just as an example, I'm not sure about coal seam gas, although I'm sure it's, it makes um, gas an extraordinarily expensive commodity, but if you add the, um, and this study's been done in, in the United States, if you add all the externalities to the price of coal becomes one of the most expensive sources of energy. Um, and so the, you know, the, whole, the whole argument that coal is cheap and plentiful is really, really not grounded in reality at all. Um, and I'll give it to Tim. Well, putting my local government hat on, um, we have considerable experience in Gunnedah Shire where we don't have the money to look after the roads that we have. There are roads that the mines built, um, purpose built for the mines, those mines closed down. We're now left with bitumen roads that we didn't want, we didn't ask for. There are no future funds put aside for those roads to be maintained into the future. And our main roads in the area that have considerably more traffic than the roads that were put in for the mines, we can't afford to actually look after those. So whilst um, I hear what you're saying about that money should go to the whole nation as such. There has to be some local return for the impost of having the industries like they are. How that is divvied up, I can't imagine, but I certainly know on our very small scale in Gunnedah that the impost that we have from those projects is absolutely huge. So I don't think there is an answer, but certainly there needs to be more money coming back. And when you look at a project like Chenois, if they um, 
produce what they are intending to produce through their lifespan, that project is actually worth about $92 billion on the current coal price, and they are putting $5 million into a community fund to try and get a social licence to operate. So try telling me there's not something wrong with that. Actually, on that topic, I, I was listening to the radio this morning quite serendipitously, and um, the, Josh Fox was on the... It was an American broadcast. I don't know if you've, you're aware of uh, Gasland the movie. Now, Josh Fox did that movie. Some will call him a documentary maker. Others will call him a journalist. Others call him a fairy tale maker from Disney. But anyway... There was some discussion on there, as, um, as um, Helen was saying, about uh, pavilion in Wyoming. And the water from those wells is stunting plant growth. It's actually stunting the plant growth. The plants are just crook. But the point I wanted to make here on, on this topic, Jacinda, is that the EPA has agreed to deliver fresh water to four homes in Dimmick due to contamination. That is a major... Um, acceptance of some guilt here. But this is the point. They have said that they are going to put in a water line worth $12 million to serve 18 families. So where does that balance up if you're going to spend all this money to serve 18 families? Like, it, the, the, the proportions and the magnitude of the money and the damage are, are just extreme. And this, this is, this is as, recent, as recent as today. Josh Fox, he got arrested and removed from a public, a public Senate hearing on Capitol Hill on Friday, I think it was. Um, so you've got this situation where people are being attacked for reporting the truth and stating the facts. You've got the bullying and the manipulation that Tim was talking about. And whatever tactics are being used there, these companies work internationally. So expect the same. Thanks. All that uh, raises the question of responsibility. Um, for example, in terms of the coal seam gas mining that's been done in the United States, I think it was Helen mentioned how when they've finished the mining, uh, they just simply cap it um, and walk the mining companies and walk away and leave it. And uh, the security of how they do that, you know, is not proven. So there's the risk that it could rust and it could decay and, and so on and, and further gas could escape. Um, I must say just quickly that I've been incredibly moved by hearing um, what Tim and Rosemary have said, you know, from the front line of this fight. And uh, I appreciate you coming here to talk to us and sharing all that with us. And I hope, you know, when you go back home, you can take um, some encouragement back with you that people in Sydney are listening and going to do their best to uh, work with you. One of the things we obviously do have to do is to make the mining companies responsible for the total cost. Again, like Helen said about coal, if you add in all these uh, in, you know, incidental costs that their, their accountants um, don't add up, um, maybe that's one strategy we should force, that they need to be responsible for the total cost. And that includes the long-term um, security and environmental sustainability, etc., of the areas that they've destroyed and compensation to local communities and so forth. So is there any action being taken um, in that area to make these companies fully responsible for the damage they do? Well, sorry. We've done considerable work in trying to um, have it adopted at the point of expiration that a 
landholder has a parent company guarantee. And for instance, with regard to BHP, back to the limited assets of London, not the Coal Mines Australia assets, which go to a holding company uh, via the Netherlands and several other places because of tax construction. Because one of the major issues is, as we saw with James Hardy and asbestos, that what happens is the company under which they operate their Australian operations suddenly loses all its assets overnight and we end up with this huge bill. Now, there are some 130 something or other, last count, mines in New South Wales that are in suspended animation. Now, the reason why they're in suspended animation because is if they are decommissioned, they need to be rehabilitated. And a lot of those mines that are um, creating acid mine leakage into the infrastructure surrounding where they are, have got, the government might have a five, ten, twenty thousand dollar bond to rehabilitate those mines with a thirty or forty million dollar clean up bill. So they don't decommission them, they simply put them in suspended animation. And if you look behind those projects, many of the operational companies that have those projects suspended now have got dead directors and tuppence halfpenny in the bank with no possible recourse for anyone. Um, in the Canadian model, they actually have to pay rehabilitation fees as you go along and they put up a huge fee, like $100 million at the beginning, which is pay given back to them as they progress and they rehabilitate. So in Australia, we have an appalling record for doing that, and we have very, very bad standards that are enforced, and it is something that as a community, we have looked at doing considerable work on. And certainly with my political connections, I've done a considerable amount of work in doing that as well. Uh. Uh, just following up on that idea of action, uh, you know, action at the idea of legislation for the uh, uh, responsibility for companies to pay up uh, and action at the farm gate and all those things in the local community. But the, my question is to Helen really about the doctors, you know. Uh, what uh, forms of action uh, has been going on and wh uh, who do you lobby or uh, and maybe what's your base you're working from but if you could tell us something about your action part you know please good question so, <laughs> so we're all we're all um, busy doctors we're, and um, some are retired uh, who sort of put in a bit more we're from all around Australia we've also got a very active uh, medical student body actually they're just they're some of the most creative uh, bits of our organisation and, um, and they've done some really fantastic, fantastic things. We run um, little conferences, uh, we participate, we um, get um, plenary sessions in, in conferences, try to educate our peers about, about the issues, um, write submissions to um, things that we think are, are important to represent the health aspects on, such as um, coal, coal development, coal development such as these parliamentary inquiries into coal seam gas. Um, we lobby politicians. I'm going there this, this Thursday to Canberra to see um, Combe and um, the independents as well on not only coal seam gas but coal as well. Um, so we have um, a small but very active um, sort of active membership and then quite a large membership base around, around the country. Um, and we're trying to expand that because, um, you know, it, but it's interesting how few people, well, you have to sort of really spell it out to people and make, make, get them to think along the lines of, well, um, you know, ultimately all this environmental damage, it affects our health. And actually it's affecting it already. It's just we, people don't talk about it um, and people just um, carry on as though everything's fine and when it's not. So I guess we do a lot of work around climate change um, as well, and um, so, so yeah, and, and all our work is on the website. There's a lot of articles written and things like that. It's all on, on our website, dea.org. Thank you. Thank you.
<laughs> Hello. Yes, there, there's another issue that links uh, grain with uh, fuel. I read recently that uh, the United States government has an ambition to fuel its whole navy with uh, biofuel, and uh, they have some uh, some link with uh, the Manildra Group, and um, I think they're expecting to do some uh, distilling on the the east coast here. So on the one hand, they're acting as if uh, grain is um, an endless supply, and on the other, they're um, they're destroying the the source of it. Uh, I was going to ask if you could explain to me uh, what this gas is going to be used for, if it's um, domestic or uh, industrial. Yes. Sorry, well. Are we actually, you're referring to the ethanol or you're referring to the, you're referring to the CSG? There's, there's two parts of the... The CSG. Right. Well, the... Uh, we'll just answer a little bit about the ethanol for a moment. Um, uh, lots of people see the uh, feedlotting industry as being the, you know, the big bad feedlotters. Um, maybe they are, maybe they aren't. But one thing about ethanol production is, um, as you have a lot of ethanol production in the US, they actually use the grain from the ethanol production then to go into feeding livestock. Um, so it's actually... While there's lots of discussion about taking grain out of food production for ethanol, it actually is one part of the process where you actually then can use those byproducts for other things. With regard to the um, CSG industry, they are talking about using that for um, energy for generating electricity, um, running engines, so you would actually have um, gas engines um, in the US where you have natural gas, where people are allowed to use their own um, gas on their own properties, you have many farmers that run all their irrigation pumps on their own gas. But the CSG um, gas is slightly harder to use, more harmful to machinery. Oh, <laughs> Carry on. <laughs> and... Um, <laughs> Um, more harmful to machinery, it's a much harsher thing. But it is used in um, electricity production, running engines and the like. And I'm sure Rosemary will have a comment on this as well. One of the things that's come out recently in Queensland is that um, the Anna Bly had said that there is going to be 20% gas, coal seam gas used um, domestically. She's now said, no, it's all for export and we may retain a couple of gas fields for our use later on. So most of this coal seam gas is going overseas for export. I think AGL Camden is the only one that's using it domestically. And um, it's... Um, you know, it's a thing that constantly comes up with gas companies because they say, we, you know, you need it and all this sort of stuff, but it's going overseas. So, there you are. Oh, I don't have a question as such. I'd just like to um, tell you who I am and why I'm here. My name is John Perry. I'm a council on Holroyd City Council. And I'm also the Senior Vice President of WESROC, which is a Western Sydney regional organisation of councils which represent 
10 of the biggest councils in New South Wales. I raised this issue last year and put it on the agenda for Wesrock to take up the issue of coal seam gas mining in New South Wales and particularly in our farming areas. We've already had Dr Edmund come out and speak to us at Wesrock. I was born in the country, I come from the country, I know and have been involved in farming for most of my life. The critical issue that I see from, from our point of view is that metropolitan Sydney has to get involved now. The country people cannot win this argument by themselves. I can give you an assurance now that Wesrock has it on the agenda. We intend to lobby all councils in New South Wales. We intend to lobby the LGSA and lobby our state politicians and put pressure on them from a united local government front to take up this issue on behalf of our farmers and to ensure the future of our food supply in New South Wales and Australia. Because it's no good us sitting back. We're complacent in metropolitan Sydney when it comes to country issues. It's got a small gathering here tonight. But the majority of, New, of metropolitan New South Wales will not realise the damage that's being done until it's too late and there's no food on the shelves. So I'd just like to give you people a commitment here tonight that Wesrock will be lobbying hard to ensure that the entire New South Wales Local Government Association supports the farmers of New South Wales and stops this ridiculous coal seam gas mining in our area. Do you have any comments on that one? Or? Only good luck with it because you'll need it. Because there's a lot of people that are very supportive of the gas industry and local government, and I face them on a day to day basis. Well, they say it's regional development, and it's, um, it's not good regional development at all. So thank you very much, and we're very grateful. Indeed. Mm. I want to echo those, those comments because I think the the question of moving now, I mean, I think the speakers have really made such an utterly compelling case. And the question of not waiting, um, already Queensland has thousands of wells um, and, and more, many more, tens of thousands more in the pipelines, and, and uh, we, we don't want to see that um, go ahead. And it's going to be a lot harder if it does go ahead to reverse it. Um, so now is the time really to move, and I think we do have to take the words of Rosemary and, and Tim um, to heart in terms of getting, you know, the city needs to join on the blockades um, and down at, at Macquarie Street and I'm part of Stop CSG Sydney along with uh, Jacinta and, and others here but I think we, we need more people um, certainly joining in there. I mean we have our own, you know, uh, this is coming to the city as well in terms of St Peter's and, and the, um, the entire Sydney Basin is a, a licence to drill. Uh, but also, I mean, even if that wasn't the case, it's the food, it's the water, um, and, and so on. Um, also, I think there's a media war on, and I think that's something that we've got to um, wage as well. Um, the, the advertising, the second trench of the advertising is, is uh, coming. Gina Reinhart's buying up her share of the media, so we can expect to... to uh, she, she doesn't do that for no reason. Um, the um, question I wanted to ask was around um, your take on the hypocrisy, it seems to me, quite blatant hypocrisy of the state government in regards to wind compared to coal seam gas. Um, we have wind, uh, we have much more stringent uh, laws, regulations, etc. coming down uh, where little or zero evidence uh, of, of harm from, from wind power. Uh, and just some uh, strong, lob strong, strongly supported lobby groups, uh, and then coal seam gas with massive evidence uh, of problems, health problems, environmental problems, water problems, etc., um, and social problems, and uh, they're just doing nothing about it. So if you could comment on that. Yeah, it's outrageous. Um, and we're... Um, <laughs> We have a um, position statement on, on wind as well, and we've, um, we've got quite a lot of public health physicians in amongst our membership who are pretty active. So we've, we've gone and we've re reviewed all the literature regarding um, the health effects of, 
of, of wind power and this sort of so-called wind turbine syndrome. Um, and, um, and there is no good evidence for, um, for health impacts that are directly from the wind turbines. Um, unfortunately, people, well, people, some people don't like them and they don't want them there and they do cause annoyance and they do cause some level of noise, but the, the, the regulation of the wind, wind industry was already very tight, much tighter than the gas industry in terms of setbacks, in terms of getting consent of landholders. You know, I mean, the wind industry was already, um, you know, being extremely careful about the way they went about things, and now they've just made it so difficult. Um, so uh, it, it doesn't make any sense to me um, at all um, when we've got um, climate change on our doorstep and we've got a clean option um, that can work and in parts of Europe wind energy has been used for generations upon generations uh, without any ill effects and you know I think um, there's a lot of fear mongering, there's a lot of um, you know, uh, people who are very active in trying to get just the wrong message across to government and um, yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of a disaster because the government's actually listening, um, but not to the right people. Oh, the watermelons brought on some wind. <laughs> when I um, saw wind turbines in Germany 25 years ago, I remember driving across the landscape and thinking, don't they look fantastic? So I'm not quite sure what everyone carried on about. Um, the only criticism I have of the current wind industry and the turbines that they are building is that since they started building the gearboxes in India rather than Germany, um, they tend to replace them much more frequently and they're a couple of million bucks each time they do that and that I think is very poor form and they should be going back to German or Dutch or Swiss technology to, to build those gearboxes because the Indian ones simply don't stand up. Um, I know many people that live close to the wind farms at Bungendore. I've spent a lot of time around the ACT and none of those people have got criticisms of them. I have never lived close to one, but certainly I don't find them offensive on the um, landscape. And I find it absolutely phenomenal that people will carry on about a wind tower the way they carry on about it. And yet you can build a coal mine 300 metres from someone's house an open cut coal mine and that is not regulated and yet you can't put a wind turbine up. So I, I just cannot come at the double standard on it. And I think that um, wind power forms an important part of the alternative energy paths in which we need to go down. I don't think we can turn the whole of Australia into wind energy, but I do think we need solar. I'm not even a great... Um, uh, fan of geothermal, having seen what geothermal does to water resources, and certainly I think geothermal has a very long way to go, but I think solar thermal plants are indeed a very exciting prospect, and we should be grabbing them with both hands and building as many as we can. Thanks, Tim. It's come down to that part of the night where I have to call for last drink questions. Oh, What's the of official position of the New South Wales Farmers Association? And what do they say to their friends and colleagues within the nationals who sit in the New South Wales government? I'll take that as a comment. Who's having a crack? I'll have a crack. Tim, have a crack. Well, I... <laughs> um, we might go to the um, nationals first. Um, I felt so strongly about the uh, performance of the nationals in regional New South Wales that I stood in the state election against a um, sitting member of um, some 23 years and uh, removed about 9% off his primary vote in an election that was uh, basically a landslide for the coalition. I think that the uh, nationals are no longer the national party, they are the multinational party. <laughs> and I think the way that they have behaved towards regional Australia 
and the people that have supported them and believed in them for so long has been unbelievably disappointing. And if I was cruel, I would say it was totally disgraceful. Um, Fiona Simpson started with us um, at Karuna Cole. Um, in the first instance, she is now the president of New South Wales Farmers. And they have done an enormous amount of work in the background um, trying to get some resolution in the um, regional land use policies in the understanding um, of land use conflict. And one thing that comes very loud and clear is that the mining industry will not negotiate if it comes to giving anything up. And one point that I failed to make in my earlier um, speech was, good fences make good neighbours, and until we draw fences around those industries and set certain areas aside for certain things, then it is basically civil war. And that is what we are facing, is a land use war. And until a government admits that we actually do have to fence things out, that we have to set areas aside to grow wine, to breed thoroughbreds, to mine, to grow grain, to graze cattle, to grow wool, to grow cotton, to do the things we do as um, landowners, there will be no resolution in this. And there does need to be lines drawn where they say you cannot mine here. Never, ever, ever, ever. And in those mine proposals, if they are approved for a 30 or a 40 or a 50 million ton mine, that's all they ever are. They can't be a 10 million ton mine that becomes a 250 million ton mine and they just keep on getting approved and approved to get bigger and bigger and bigger. And that's what happens. Because it's just like one morning, you wake up and there's one grasshopper on your lawn. And you look out there and think, look at that cute little green grasshopper. And the next morning you roll out and there's 55 million of them on the front lawn. Everything's been eaten, it's bare and you're starving to death. Well, that's what we're suffering now. We've got the 55 million of them eating everything. Thank you, Tim. Like anything, uh, things have to come to an end. Uh, what can I say about our three speakers? Helen, Rosemary, Tim, I mean, we've been very fortunate tonight to be present with them and to feel their drive and their energy, but we also need to respect that that drive and energy is, is just not endless. Uh, they're fighting every single day, um, and it's it's long, and it's a it's a it's a difficult battle. And whilst they can come out in a in a public meeting like this and distill that energy and and build inspiration, uh, they also have to rebuild themselves and keep getting up each morning. But I feel comfortable in the knowledge that it, it's the land that that that. Fuels, fuels that energy. They, they get it from the land. I mean, their, their families have been on the land. They understand the land. They take energy from the land. They return from their campaigns down in the city and in the government and in, in the corridors of um, so-called power. And uh, then they return home to try and refuel. But we, we really need to, to back and support them as best we can and spread, spread tonight's talk, spread the information that you've got Put it out there in your social media circles. Speak to your neighbour. Make copies of tonight's talk. Because as some of the other, uh, and, and the Wesrock, as the representative of Wesrock mentioned, we need to get everyone in the city behind this. And uh, on behalf of everyone here tonight, I'd just like to thank the three of you for your energy, your effort, along with the other groups in Sydney the Stop Coal Seam Gas in Sydney, who are well re represented here today, and who are putting in the same amount of energy and the same amount of effort and need that support. So join the Karuna Coal Action Group, join the Coal Seam Gas, uh, what's the exact title? Stop CSGC 
Stop CSG Sydney, I knew it changed. Um, but join, join those and spread that information and get behind these people. You don't have to live in the Liverpool Plains to join the Corona Coal Action Group. You all live in Sydney, so join the Stop CSG Sydney. And get out there and spread this word and support these fine people because uh, they need our support because they're supporting us at the end of the day. So I'd, I'd just like to get Liz up uh, to um, thank our speakers with uh, a little bit of... Uh... Yeah, we've got a bottle of wine to thank the speakers. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, and that's, that's uh, um, Marvel Costa. Um, it's an extremely small token of our appreciation because we really do appreciate what it takes to come and talk about it. And I think... Um, Rosemary got quite emotional, but I think some people in the room would have felt quite emotional today because it's really, we take so much of what we have and, and the bounty that we have in this land for granted and we can't afford to do that. And I think, you know, there's nobody in this room who doesn't agree with that, but it's really timely to get reminded and to be reminded with the real feeling and, and passion and also the, the great information you've given this evening to remind us to keep, out, keep on going tomorrow and tomorrow and to take that out to everybody we know and to stop taking things for granted. That there's, there is, there is, there are, there's progress that I believe we can make. If I didn't, I'd just, I wouldn't get out of bed tomorrow. But it, it's bloody hard work and, I, and it's something that's very unrelenting. Thank you for the work you're doing on our, all of our behalf and I hope that we can start to repay some of that work and add to the work that you're doing.